Right now it is a Wednesday here on the John Neighbor Show, and I know that there's a lot of things happening like Razorback Spring Practice and, of course, Transfer Portal nonsense and craziness. But people forget that there is a Razorback baseball team that is the number one team in the country, and they happen to be hosting a team named LSU defending champs this weekend in Baumwalker Stadium. So let's talk more about it as we welcome in our very special guest, just like we do each and every week. It is former Razorback Tyler Spoon friend of the show and it's all thanks to of course the bank of Fayetteville here in downtown Fayetteville and Tyler what's going on man how you doing man I'm good thanks for having me back this week yeah well hey listen it's always good to talk with you it's especially talking baseball and the craziness that goes along with it so we'll get to LSU mm -hmm. but let's start with this past weekend against Auburn yeah. uh, we knew it was going to be a tough series as it always is anytime you play in the SEC and play against high quality teams but and Arkansas got the SEC victory it was great we'll talk about maybe game three but this is a series that Arkansas won, but both teams scored the same amount of runs in the series. And the margin of error was so small. But what you, just what you make of the performance and the grittiness of this team to go on the road against a tough opponent and come out with a victory? Yeah, it's, you know, the rule in the SEC is win on the road or don't get swept on the road and win at home. You know, so it's to go into an Auburn environment again. When you go to a team that just got swept or just lost a series, they probably should have won or something like that. Or a team that's just scrapping and clawing for their life, it's hard. You know, even if you get them at home, it's hard to – those teams are just backs against the wall, need anything and everything to happen. So uh, to be able to go to Auburn, which, again, is kind of a tough place to play too. So um, – and be able to take two out of three is is huge. And that's, again, very – you know, it's good that we got some really close games to see, you know, hey, we you got to be in those situations because those are those are the situations you're going to be in late in the year. You got to be able to see how the team responds and handles those type of situations. So, uh, but be able to go to Auburn on the road, starting the SEC five and one. I mean, can't ask for much more. Yeah, and especially because you know Auburn, we talked about last week. They're just a team that always was solid, but uh, I think yeah. they went to World Series a couple times. And but uh, this this year's team, it's amazing. They're sitting at one and five. Yeah, and they're a good team, but it shows you. Uh, how tough uh, it is in this conference, but look at let's go to game one, one nothing. Yep, uh, that happens in baseball. I know some baseball purists love games like that, love it when it's low scoring, quick, and uh, a great pitching battle. But uh, what'd you make not only of the performance of Hagen Smith, but also as a as a former uh, outfielder and also hitter? What do you how do you take from that? Where is it? Hey, just going up against a great ace in Auburn, and sometimes those games just happen. But uh, just how, how, what did you make of that performance from the pitching, but also from the lack of scoring from Arkansas too? Yeah, there's going to be game. You know, it's rare you get a one nothing game, but DVH, you know, probably saw the post game interview, but he was fired up. You know, he's he loves to see those kind of games, and you've got to be able to you've got to know if your team can handle that kind of situation where, you know, it's a zero zero ball game in the six. You know, which you know Loy obviously hit the home run early, but um, you know, really tight game late. You know late innings, how's your team going to handle it on the road, tough environment. So um, you're just fired up to win. At the end of the day, you never know. The, in the SEC, every Friday night guy is going to have the talent to be, you know, top three to five round pick, you know, so they're going to be good. And, it, you know, they may, sometimes they may be off, you know, maybe one night he's on and just has his stuff. And so um, I think that was just your classic, really good Friday night SEC matchup that, um, you know, again, coaches, purists, they love to see those one nothing, good defense, good pitching, you know, just scrap across one run and win the game. So, um, yeah, it, as a hitter, it can be frustrating. You're like, man, we got to pick this up, you know. So, but at the end of the day, you got to look at the picture and be like, hey, we just won on a Friday night at Auburn in the S, you know, in the SEC against a ranked opponent. Um, just take it and run with it. Well, I think also, too, not every one nothing game is probably created equal. You yeah. know, I think there's a difference if, uh, you're not scoring because you're going up against a great pitcher or just great defensive plays have been happening, or you're making your own mistakes. You know, you're, you're missing on pitches that you should be, or you have, uh, you know, moves which it, it ended up being not a huge problem because Arkansas is still one, but you think about before that home run was hit, mm -hmm. you, had, you had a double play that's, you know, it's kind of rare and probably shouldn't happen. So I think that that's also some people have to look at where, hey, if it's a one nothing game just because a great pitching battle, that's one thing. But mm -hmm. the last thing you ever want to do, I'm sure, as an offense, too, is, is make it to where you're not scoring because of your own mistakes or yeah. like you'll chalk it up, you'll tip your hat. But you can't have it when you're just going out there making your own problems and having, I don't know, not turnovers in sports, but, yeah. you know, having errors and having uh, bad moves and bad plays, especially in base running, too. Yeah, the mental mistakes, you know, those can add up pretty quick. And so. You know, you just got to really, and that's one thing, just again, DVH just harps on, is just like mentally being locked in every play, every pitch. I mean, 
you got to do it because the one time you take off mentally and you're just not mentally prepared, not mentally ready for that pitch or for the out or for what's about to happen, you've got to anticipate what's about to come. And so um, that's a lot of baseball. And so you've you got to be able to handle it. And DBH does a good job of just instilling that in every player. And so, um, you know, you just try to limit those. The mental mistakes are going to happen. There's physical mistakes, which you can handle. Like, that's going to happen. You make an error throwing the ball to first base. Like, it is what it is. But when you make a mental mistake and you're out of it and it's just you were just clueless and not prepared, that's a different story. And that's when it's really frustrating. Well, let's look at game two because that was obviously a very exciting game for multiple reasons. We'll start, though, with Ryder Helfrich. Yeah. You know, I know you've talked highly about him. Mm-hmm. And anytime that you can go into that type of position, and I still don't think that thing's landed yet. I mean, I think <laughs> yeah. they ended up saying it was only 405 or 410 or 420, but it was like, no, that that feel like it was like yeah. so far. But to have that type of play in that moment, top of the ninth, uh, just what does that do for a young kid like Ryder Helfrick, and especially at the plate? building that confidence and being able to in that moment in that spot uh hit a home run that ends up being the difference in not only the game but in the series for arkansas yeah big for him i mean especially you know obviously he's been scuffling this year it's not not a secret so it's sometimes it just takes one swing of the bat one play one pit you know whatever it is and just gets a guy rolling again so if that's a moment where we can get Ryder helford back to the point where he's you know, obviously defensively it's unbelievable, but um, just like you threw the guy out at second, yeah. you know, also in the same game, I mean, big, big, big time throw. So um, if you can get that guy going, going, just like Butch Thompson said after the game, he's like that guy, I think everybody in the country recruited that guy. So um, he's unbelievable. And if you can get him going, add another bat like that to the lineup where consistently he's doing a lot of damage, it's, you know, again, I, I still think this offense has – it's about 70 percent of the way there and so if the couple of the pieces that are there that you know maybe haven't done it yet that we anticipated doing it you can get those guys going i think you know, hopefully we can just get things clicking at the right time well also with uh you know the catcher position is, is something that we've we've talked about where mm-hmm. you know you, you've had parker roll in there and it seems like they, they've gotten more and more comfortable him there but then you know Ryder helfrick and, and what he can bring to the table it's like, do you feel like that the catcher position they're finally settled in and, and, and they feel good? Or you still think it's going to work its way out to where uh, you're going to have one guy kind of for the most part uh, moving forward? Yeah, it's tough because I think, you know, Hudson White has a proven track record. So it's like you almost you got to give him some more opportunities and just see if he can ever get it clicking because you just know he's produced in the Big 12 at a high level and know it's in there. So um, but that catcher spot, again, it's again, it, it's kind of for grabs still. And, it, you know. As you see, we're rotating catchers a lot, so um, it may not be solidified until the end of the year. It may never be solidified, and that's just how it goes. Sometimes you just roll with who hits well in BP that day, or you know who's uh, you know hopping around better that day, and that or that week in practice. You never know. It just it, it, DVH just has a good feel for who to play, and again, he's still just also trying to find out. <laughs> Who wants to take this job? So. Yeah, yeah, because it can go a lot of different directions too. But uh, you know, speaking with Tyler Spoon, former Razor back here on the John Neighbor Show, thanks to the Bank of Fayetteville here in downtown Fayetteville. So Tyler, uh, I, something in the game that happened, it was, I don't, and I don't want to say it was funny, but it was interesting, is where you have a, a foul ball that hits the umpire's face mask. Sheesh. Yeah. And you know that's always a, a scary thing, mm-hmm. and, and kind of he kind of falls down and knocks him out a little bit, but. Uh, he ends up getting out and getting okay and everything, but then he leaves the game, and then there's like a 30-minute delay because the umpire, that guy's going to come in. He doesn't have the equipment. He needs to go. Somebody said that he had to go to the hotel to get the, the extra equipment that they needed, and then they bring him in on a golf cart. Like, it was, wow. it was a very unique thing. That's, like, that's only a baseball feel, thing, I feel like. But, like, how, like, have you ever seen anything like that in a game ever? No. I, I mean, there's been times where, you know, I've played and an umpire gets hurt, but usually it's just like – the umpire has his equipment in the locker room. You just go get it on real quick, and five minutes later, we're ready to roll. Um, yeah, that was pretty pretty wild. Um, obviously, not something you ever, you know, you got to prepare for, but never anticipate happening. So, yeah, 40, 30, 45-minute delay, man, that just throws everything off. So a little bizarre, but it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know you've, we've talked about, like, rain delays, lightning delays, and yeah. all that, but especially that late in the game, that late at night, mm-hmm. I mean, does that have more of an impact on – the game or, or from the hitters or from the fielders or the, even the pitchers but is that more impactful when it's later and, and it's longer and those types of delays in the game yeah it could be for sure especially if a team is you know um in a situation where you know for us in, at a&m in 2015 we were down eight to three i think eight yes, to two something I do, like that, yeah, yeah. I remember that yeah. and we got rained out 
yep. in like the sixth, seventh inning of Saturday night. And so we moved to the next day. We're like, all right, we're just going to pick it up Sunday and we'll play game three after that. Well, we come back and win that game and then win the next game and win the series. And I fully believe if we had played that game out the that Saturday night, we wouldn't have won. So it can just fully disrupt the flow and the momentum, everything that's going on with the team that maybe, you know, fortunately for us, it was in our favor. So, um, but it could have easily been the other way around. So any, any disruption like that can just, you never know. You just hope, hopefully it doesn't throw your team out of rhythm if they're, if they're rolling and, or making a comeback or, you know, adding a big lead, whatever it is. So yeah, it, it can do a lot of damage. Well, and that's what I'm curious about. Cause I think we've talked with, how Dave Van Horn handles those things. But when it comes to coming back from that, is it a, a toughness thing? Is it a culture thing? Is it Because I feel like not every team can respond well in it. And, you know, sometimes baseball things happen. But uh, what do you think is the key of having a team that's able to overcome and come back out out of that and play really well? Like, what's the key factor in that? Well, for us in 2015, and we were, uh, we were kind of happy that game was – postponed that night because we were yeah. like get, get us out of here but you know you wake up that next day and you're like all right clean slate like you know in that in that moment you're like man they're just absolutely steamrolling us right now and then you wake up the next day you're like all right new day let's let's get after it and find a way to win and you know but then on the flip side if you're on you know if you're up eight to three eight to two you've got to know like hey that we gotta we gotta take care of business and you know step on their throat and find a way to to finish the job so um you know usually if it's a 45 minute hour delay it's it's more or less just just you gotta stay moving you gotta stay kind of locked in swinging a bat throwing a ball whatever it is just don't sit down and get comfortable and no, don't kind of zone out if that makes sense so you just got to stay locked in and try to stay in the moment in the game and don't let it you know get away from you and just make sure you're prepared as soon as that you know it's time to play ball again so well, speaking of locking in, uh, Arkansas has an opponent named LSU mm -hmm. coming to town. Yeah, it seems like that one is always uh, all the series are big, but there's mm -hmm. always an extra thing to that. But LSU's and they have two and four in SEC yeah. play, haven't won an SEC series yet. They're in I don't call it desperation mode, but they definitely want to get some wins going to try because it's not going to get any easier for them. But what what do you just make of this matchup? But specifically LSU coming in where. Arkansas's five and one, two SEC series victories, but then LSU's desperate team that's trying to get some victories their way, especially in a tough SEC schedule. Yeah, it's again, you never want to play a team that you know is good that is kind of hurting at the moment, you know. And so you either you either catch them at the right time where they're just scuffling and can't get out of it, or you're the reason they turn it around. And you never want to be the reason they turn it around. So um, we just got to find a way, you know, win win two. If you win three, outstanding. But it's a team that's, you know, they've got some star power. You know, Luke Coleman's coming in, throwing Friday night. He's every bit of a potential first, second round guy. Tommy White, obviously, a potential top 10 pick. I mean, the, the talent's there. The athletes are there. It's going to be loud, crazy. Take advantage of this game being at home and find a way to win, too. So it's going to be it's going to be a fun series. You know, again, LSU's going to be scrapping for their lives. And, you know, Jay Johnson's a great coach and, you know, not defending national champions with you know, a lot of the core talent returning. I think, you know, they're, they're going to know what they're up against and know exactly what to expect coming into this place. So we just need to be prepared. So it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday series once again. And, you know, Hagen Smith has been that guy. I, yeah. I mean, I don't think that's uh, unfair to say that right now, if he's not the clubhouse leader in the uh, Golden Spikes Award, I don't know who is, but like just how how what can he go up and what can he do more against a team like LSU yeah. like what I mean he's shown so much but what do you feel like to be comfortable about this getting especially that game one win which is so important but what mm -hmm. do you need to see from Hagen against this LSU team that's got a lot of talent a lot of really good hitters too yeah you, you got to expect you know when you get to the SEC you're gonna you know and this is a good thing about having a guy with SEC experience in Hagen where it's never going to be just a coast the entire year you know Hagen had some situations at Auburn where like one hit and he could have given up three or four runs you know so um but you got to be able to have a guy that's going to be able to handle that pressure and just the awareness of um you know or just the calmness i should say to to be able to stay in that moment and just not try to do too much not let the moment get too big kind of deal but um there's going to be a lot of that this week too you know tomorrow i mean yeah. there's probably going to be a time where the bases are loaded you know one out two outs make the pitch, you know, stay, stay in control. And he does a really good job of just, he's just very aggressive in attacking hitters. He's just not scared to, you know, and that's what you gotta, you gotta have no fear when you're on the bump. You can't pitch or try to pitch around guys and be easy. Cause next thing you know, you look 
look up and you're trying to be perfect and you're two, it's a two O count to Tommy white. And you're like, well, now I got to throw to him. So, um, yeah, he, he, he does a really good job. You just gotta, he's, he's just going to stay true to himself. And if he does that, um, you know, I think we'll be in a good spot. His, his stuff is just so good that if he can just, again, just stay within everything that he's done this year so far, he'll be just fine. Yeah, we were even talking, I think it was me and Andrew Ellis were talking about last year against LSU. You know, Arkansas beat Paul Skeens twice. Yeah. And it was funny because in the game, of course, down there in Baton Rouge, Arkansas won game one but lost the doubleheader the next day. Mm -hmm. And then they beat him in the SEC tournament. What it was is in, I believe, is the first time they met, they had, uh, it, I think it was Hunter Holland starting, and then Hagen yeah. Smith came in and finished. Mm -hmm. And then it was the opposite, where you had Hagen Smith come in in the SEC tournament, and then Hunter Holland finished. But there was something about those lefties yeah. that they struggled against. So do you think that Van Horn going in this game, he might, I, mean, I don't know, you don't have Hunter Holland on the team anymore, but do you yeah. think that they go lefty heavy, kind of what they did last year, and try to see if they can uh, kind of mimic some of that magic? Yeah, you know, and they, there's enough you know, data at this point in the season, you know, DVH probably knows really well, you know, they, they all know Hobbs knows, Hey, you know, they're hitting, you know, 160 against lefties. Like, let's, let's just throw the house of lefties at them. You know, whether it's Hagen and Fisher or Hagen and, um, going blank on the lefties name. That's really good. That's uh transfer this year, but, um, you know, just maybe it's a lefty head, lefty heavy, uh, pitching staff tomorrow yep. night, whatever it is, but that information that they have is going to be valuable. Maybe it's a lefty and then bring a righty in. But um, at the same time, you also get McIntyre, who's just been nails. Yeah. And so you got to, that's where the hard part comes in where do you look at the data the whole time or do you go with the guy you really trust that you know it's a good combo off Hagen that's, you know, a good enough change of pace with a really good cutter that's a tough pitch to hit as it is? Do you just trust what's been working so far? So, yeah, it'll be interesting. There will be there'll be some combinations and some stuff that maybe are different, but, again, they're going to have the best informed decision to make. So, I, I don't want to sound too cocky or too arrogant, but, man, just with Hagen doing what he's doing, it's really hard to think that Arkansas is going to lose game ones this year. I, I know that it might yeah. happen. I think Isaiah Campbell – Back in 2019, you know, people sometimes forget how just good he was, but he yeah. only lost one game. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's just a very difficult thing. It obviously makes such a big difference in these series. But I just look ahead. It's like, man, it's just hard for me to think that Hagen Smith, at least yeah. given if he can give you six innings like he usually has been doing, it's hard for me to think that there's going to be a lot of runs scored up against him as long as he's on the mound. Yeah, and but again, yeah, it's so hard to – it's so hard to win – eight games seven yeah. games as a pitcher in the sec sure. and you know because you look up and if the other pitcher is having a really good night you're facing a paul Skeens and he gives up three hits one's a, one's a home run and solo shot and then you give up two hits and you hit a batter and then next pitch is a home run and then two to one and it's yeah. like didn't pitch a bad game you just have one bad pitch so it's hard to do and that just speaks to how good and how dominant he's been but yeah he if he you got to expect you there's probably going to be one maybe two outings where he gives up three five runs you know that, it's just going to happen it's inevitable it, no matter who you are all the way through the big leagues if you're the most dominant pitcher in the big leagues you're going to have an outing where you give up three to three to five six runs whatever you're just gonna have a bad outing you can't avoid it and so um but yeah it, it, we that's where hopefully i was really glad to see this past weekend saturday and sunday Glad, I wasn't happy to see it, but I was glad to see Brady struggle a little bit and Molina yeah. struggle a little bit. Just so it kind of is like a kick in the butt for the offense that says, hey, oh, we actually got to score runs. Like, we got to do this. So um, I'm, I'm curious. I'm excited for us to get to that point where we score eight runs on a Friday night and Hagen, if he gives up three or four, you know, we don't have to worry about it. So, well, I think LSU, of course, we talked about them and being motivated and coming into this, but. The series is always going to have some juices. I think that's probably going to be not saying a record crowd, but yeah. you're not going to have to worry about any seats being empty at Baum Walker. When you went up against LSU and uh, the years that you played against them, mm -hmm. like it was was there certain a certain game, certain series, certain thing that you remember that really sped, uh, turned out whenever Arkansas and LSU faced each other out there on the field. 2013, it was us and LSU. I can't remember. I think I think it was top ten matchup, but Alex Bragman, Aaron Nola, Mason Katz, you know. Ray Frimes, I mean, all these guys that just were, you know, Jacoby Jones, too. He was a big yeah. leaguer. Um, just it was a an absolute just battle. And it was, you know, they won Friday. Stanek shut them out Saturday. And then you get to game three. And that was the series I kind of realized, you know, how good we were and what it w meant for people to beat us. But, you know, it was a close game Sunday, and I think they won by one or two runs. And then, you know, after that final out, they were, like, fired up. And it was like, dang, like, that's LSU. They were 
that's kind of the point you realize that, man, we had a good team. But that that whole series was just like intense. Every pitch, it felt like a super regional. It felt like the super regional we played in 2015 against Missouri State. Just high intensity, high adrenaline the entire time. You're just flying around, playing against the best players in the country. And it's just, yeah, that, that one sticks out to me a lot. Was that in – LSU or no, was it was here. That, okay. that was here. And that was, was that was thinking. a tough. That was a that was a tough one. Tough pill to swallow for that one to yeah. lose that one at home. So yeah, well, I mean, LSU is just one of those programs that they've been established and, and they've been around forever. And you know, Jay Johnson being the coach there, I think that that's kind of the thing where uh, he came in and they won a national championship last year. And you know, they didn't win every series. They I think they mm-hmm. were number four seed, five seed overall when it was all said and done. But, you know, it's just one of those programs that I feel like anytime you face them, no matter who the coach is, no matter what their record is, no matter what, yeah. it, it, there's a there's a sign of respect and there's a sign of energy. And uh, I think even for a guy like Peyton Stovall going up against yeah. the home state school and everything, I think there's just always going to be an element of extra excitement. But it's a matter of Dave Van Horn keeping everything in check. How does he do that in the games like this to make sure the teams, his guys, aren't over-fired up, aren't over-emotional or anything, mm-hmm. just – focused on, hey, this is just another game, another team, another series. Let's go out and take care of business. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to routine. And, you know, it, it, he is the same guy day in, day out, no matter who the opponent is. And, you know, you have a leader, you have a head coach that's, you know, just as fired up for playing a 1-10 in 10 team or playing LSU, a top five team. That's what you need. you got to have the same calmness, consistency. Obviously, the adrenaline is going to be going. You can't avoid that. Like, it's just going to happen. But – don't try. Don't change anything. Just be who you are. Just continue to do the things that have made you successful, and just trust the process. You know. And again, it's just you know, Arkansas and LSU, two of the most respected programs in the country. It's just going to be an absolute dogfight. And so, um, yeah, it'll be a fun one. There's always a little bit more edge, but you just stay, just stay true to what you've been doing all year. What's made you successful. Don't try to do anything special just because it's you know LSU coming in town. Just just keep playing the way you are. It's a random question. Was it was did you go up against Kramer Robertson when he was there? At LSU? I th- yes, I think he was there in 2015. Yeah, I, I just don't... hated that guy. And, and it has nothing to do with him personally, but it was mainly because Kim Mulkey, who was the coach of Baylor at yes, the time, yes. they just showed her all the time. And I, I just got sick That's of that funny. guy. So I don't, I, know you, I don't know when you were playing against him. You probably didn't see it as much because you were in the game. But I just remember, like, yeah. I didn't know if – I couldn't remember if he played up against him. But he was a really good player, too, for LSU. Yeah, he was. I, you know, I, you know I, don't, I don't remember him much. I remember the name. Um, but, yeah – Yeah, LSU seems to always have really good shortstops. And so, you know, it's – one of those things. Yeah, he was he was a good player. They they just run those short, good shortstops in and out of that yeah. program. Yeah, you could call it a we'll call it shortstop you, you know, or whatever they throw around for like. Why not? Yeah, I just throw <laughs> it out there to him. Um, <clears throat> also, too, speaking of Dave Van Horn, I meant to bring this up. He didn't coach in the game. Yeah, uh, which we got a statement in the media about him for a personal matter, but mm-hmm. we kind of all put it together. His daughter expecting triplets, and luckily and thankfully everything's good, and yeah. she's, oh, the kids are healthy and. His daughter's healthy, but uh, I've never seen that. Or Dave Van Horn is in the game. Matt Hobbs took over, and they got yeah. the win, and I think he did a really good job. But, uh, you know, we were talking before we started the interview. You, there was never a time where Dave Van Horn wasn't coaching. But, mm-hmm. uh, like, just how, how do you feel like that would be not having Skipper, not having Dave Van Horn there? Yeah. And Hobbs, or all of them are capable, but it's got to change some things, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, you got to think, you know, it's obviously having him there. It's just a presence deal, you know, not having that presence there of the head coach. But at the same time, you you know, Hobbs and Thompson have been here for a while, you know. So, like I said before the show, Hobbs is – he's going to be a phenomenal head coach at some point. You know, he's got that calm demeanor. He's level-headed, you know, really knows the game, knows what he's doing. And so, you know, you're just having him step up and fill those shoes and you have full confidence in Hobbs just because, again, he's got that established – uh, resume and just has been around the block and knows what he's doing. So, um, but definitely, you know, it's it's definitely weird looking up and not seeing DVH on that dugout step, and you're like, oh man, that's weird. But um, again, I think they did a good job just stepping in and just you know filling that void at the end of the day, just get the job done, find a way. And we did, yeah. We mm. thank goodness. So yeah. Well, I'm I'm not going to speak for Dave Van Horn. I'm just guessing here. He loves his daughter. He was there, and like there was mm-hmm. no question about him being there. It was all that. But I feel like there's still part of him that like because he said he was even watching the games and everything. You know, <laughs> I feel like there's part of him still like getting either irritated or getting like ultra like almost like I don't know if he was texting somebody, <laughs> but I just feel like him knowing him and knowing the competitor that he is and 
all of that. Uh, it just makes me wonder if how much, what kind of, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall yeah. to hear some of the conversations or some of the things he may have been saying during that game. Yeah, you got to know, either like on his phone watching or whatever it was, but you know he's just locked in every pitch, every oh, every yeah. second, and who knows, maybe texting some of the guys, I don't know, <laughs> you know, telling Hobbs, get this guy out of one, who knows, yeah. but uh, yeah, that's, I can imagine. I, I'm just thinking if I'm in that position, I would definitely be locked in. I would either have to be locked in every pitch or I would throw my phone as far away as possible and not even think about it. Like just force people not to even let me go near technology so I can't watch or know yeah. what's going on. So yeah, I, I, I couldn't have handled it either. I know, again, it was no question he was going to be with his daughter. So it's yeah. not like he was regretting that decision. He did the right thing. Yeah, he, he did the right thing. Absolutely. Did 100% the right thing. I just still, triplets, man, just could not. I don't imagine. Uh, nope. Power, power to her. Still, power I've got two kids and can't imagine triplets. So it's yeah, that's uh, that's something. Yeah. So I think uh, I think it was the Jim Gaffigan did a skit. It was just like if you ever wonder what it's like having five kids, he's like, just imagine having four kids, or you're drowning and someone hands you a baby. It's like that's kind of like <laughs> I feel like this kind of like it is a triplets. It's like yeah, just imagine you're drowning and here you go. Here's some oh, kids to, to mess man. with and everything. But, man, uh, but shows again. Dave Van Horn is uh, you know a, a really hard nosed baseball old school coach that. But, you know, still some things are more important. So, yeah, there, yeah there's no question that that was going to happen for him. And that's kind of like you mentioned Matt Hobbs. He, he's done a great job at Arkansas. Yeah. And, and I remember when Wes Johnson got hired at LSU, yeah. uh, Van Horn was asked about, hey, what do you think about Wes Johnson? And Van Horn, you know, was complimentary towards Wes, but he also made sure everyone knew. He's like, yeah, but, they, you know, they contacted our guy first. Yeah. You know? And so I wonder what Hobbs is waiting on. Is it just like that perfect job or is it the – uh, is, is maybe hope, uh, holding out hope for, for something. Uh, you know, I, it just makes me wonder with him, yeah. I feel like he could have gotten a job in the past two years if he wanted one. So yeah. maybe what's he holding out for? Yeah, usually in that kind of situation, you, you, most guys are either looking for a particular job, maybe it's close to home or whatever it is, or he just truly, genuinely loves being the pitching coach at the University of Arkansas. It's one of the two options. So um, regardless, I'm glad he's here. So it's, yeah. you know, I'm glad he stayed as long as he has. So. Um, but yeah, I, I, w I would bet if I had to guess, he's probably just waiting for the one job he really wants. Cause for him, you know, it's like, where else would you want to be besides being the head coach of the team you want to be mm -hmm. and, you know, the team you want to be with, you know, or, you know, the team you grew up loving or near your hometown, your family, whatever it is. So, um, yeah, who knows, you know, the opportunity is going to come at some point. It's just a matter of when. What has it been about him and, and being the pitching coach that's made Arkansas pitching so good? Is it simply recruiting? I know there's so mm -hmm. many moving parts to it, but what is his go-to thing that you've noticed about his pitchers and yeah. what makes them so good? He is so good at getting – he knows what kind of pitchers he, – he can see a kid that's seven, 16, 17 years old that's 5'10", 6' foot tall that's throwing 86, and he goes, that guy will throw 96 one day. And he and they will, and he will get them to that point. So um, he just knows it, a lot of it's the bio, biomechanics, you know, or bio, whatever that sounded right to me. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, mechanics, is but a big um, thing. you know, everything with the body that you yeah. know, how the body moves, operates, functions, and he is so in tune with that and understands it so well, but also understands you know the data and the science behind. You know, just everything that goes into throwing a baseball hard. And so yeah. he just, again, he, he knows exactly what he's looking for, and he's had enough experience and success of taking guys with a certain arm type or body type, and he can get the most out of that person. And so, you know, and also it's stuff like, you know, we have a $300,000 pitching mound. Yeah, that helps. In, in the outfield. So, <laughs> um, but that's something they use day in and day out, but that's something that helps the pitchers and helps him develop those pitchers really well and obviously the track record of just pitchers you've worked with and how they how well they've done in the draft and big leagues or whatever it is so you know he is just he's just constantly always adapting and adjusting and seems like he you know kind of at the front of all this data and analytics stuff and uh when it happened and obviously had the pitching lab at wake forest when they were really good and now he's brought it here and just obviously you see the results of it so yeah, I've always wondered because I don't know ball, obviously, but like, you know, a kid comes in, he's throwing 86. Like, what are the things that they do to just increase it by five yeah. miles an hour? Yeah. You know, I guess it is truly the 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 training that goes into it and the, you know, the body and the, and the physique. But, you know, just the little tweaks here and there that yeah. can literally change and make you go from being a good college pitcher yeah. to a guy that's potentially a, a big leaguer. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I just that's always what's fascinated me. It's just the, the and also the difference between throwing a 
92 mile an hour fastball or a 96 mile an hour fastball and just how big of a difference that is yeah it's it's crazy man sometimes it, it, it's crazy there's one guy i played with in the red sox that you know he um transitioned from being a position player or a yeah position player to a pitcher and he was throwing you know he was like 89 91 92 but um we had a pitching pitching coach that came in and he's like dude you, you're just your mechanics are just off so we changed literally two things just kind of got his body out of the way of itself and it was next thing you know he's throwing 95 96 so it's like wow. sometimes it's stuff that they already have the physical ability to do but maybe their body's just blocking the, their way of being able to do it or they're not using their body properly in a way that can maximize how much arm strength they actually have so it's just stuff like that that and that's what makes a coach really good. So it's just he's constantly learning and knows exactly what he's looking for and how to get the most out of it. Well, before I let you get out of here, Tyler, just uh, I know it's hard to predict sometimes baseball, but how do you feel like this weekend goes for the Razorbacks at home against LSU? I like us. I like the Hogs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I think our pitching is so good, and I think our offense again is is we're seeing signs of it. And I, you know, maybe we just need one weekend like this where you get ten thousand people. Um, to just really explode, um, but I think I think I like the Hogs. I really I'm not just saying that just because of you know I'm an Arkansas mm -hmm. you know born and raised and played here, but I'm saying that just trying to be f as fair as I can. I think Arkansas is just the better team right now. I really do, and I think you know pitching staff, everything hitters up and down. Maybe they have the better overall hitter in Tommy White. Um, but I think up and down the lineup, I like the Hogs and just bullpen pitching staff again. Just the matchup favors Arkansas, especially then you had being at home. It's like give me the Hogs. Yeah, so. yeah. I feel good about it. It's going to be a great weekend. It's going to be a beautiful weekend. Luckily, yeah. the weather's going to be nice. And I know everyone's excited to see Arkansas and LSU in baseball. It seems like there's yep. always a little extra juice to it. But, Tyler, as always, man, we appreciate you joining us. Enjoy the weekend and happy Easter. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you next week, hopefully continuing talking about Arkansas winning three straight SEC series, man. It's going to be great. I appreciate it. Happy Easter to you guys.